Today we continue the journey that we've been calling Peak, looking at the significance of the things that happen on mountains throughout the Bible and applying that, asking God exactly what next steps, what high points, what valleys, what, what does he want from us? And um, today we get to move into the New Testament. We get to look at Jesus. And the rest of this time we're going to be focusing on stuff that fulfills all the stuff that happened in the Old Testament. So I'm excited. I'll start here though today. There's a place called Buckbald. Anybody ever been to Buckbald? Love that place. If you've never been, you should go. It's down by Teleco Plains. We go there every year at camp and I go other times whenever I get a chance. But it's a natural bald, which means a bare spot on top of a mountain. But then people have cultivated it. So now it's kind of like a yard up there at the top with a big place to have a fire and a helipad and but the amazing thing about it is it's got a 360 degree view. You can just literally see for miles and miles and miles in every direction. And there's just a sense of uh, clarity, a sense of just awareness of what's real and what's true. That's what happens at high places. That's why these mountains are such a big deal. Even uh, idolaters in the Old Testament kind of counterfeited that idea. And so the high places became a place where they worshiped idols. But the idea started with God. The idea, it's just kind of part of how we're wired and how it works. When we can see more than we see, when we can have a moment of clarity where we can see in several directions and we know where we fit in, it calls us something in our soul about what it looks like to be truly blessed in the scriptural idea. And we've been talking about that quite a bit, so I won't get my pans out again right this minute. But the idea is that to be blessed in the Bible is to live life fully. You're in touch with God. You're in touch with everyone else. You do stuff that means something. You are fully connected with life. You're fully connected in all those directions at once. Throughout the scriptures, there was the tabernacle and the temple, and both of those told a story about salvation through Jesus. That's a whole nother thing. But the one of the places you keep seeing people come back to over and over was mountains. And people held these mountains in high esteem. Mount Sinai, Mount Zion, Mount Gerizim. They, they were held, these were, people would fight over which one of these you would go to to worship and which was the best one to worship on. That's why all of this swirled around and this is why it was so shocking to the Samaritan woman and everybody else when Jesus said, you know, there's a time coming and it's now come when it won't even matter which mountain you're on. You're going to be able to worship in spirit and in truth. You're going to be in touch with God and aware of what's real and how you fit in. Just like you kind of feel on high places, you're going to be able to have that just wherever you are because it's never been about the mountains. It's been about me. Jesus faithfully attempted the temple. He faithfully attended the synagogue. I'd say most of what we have recorded of the things he said were said there. But I don't think it was an accident that his first big message happened on a mountain. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. The place where it happened was called Mount Eremos. It's in the Eremos Grotto, which is a beautiful spot in the Holy Land that has a mountain, obviously. It also gently turns into a plain. There's a cave up on the mountain. There's a beautiful view of the water below. And, and there, I, I personally believe Jesus probably spent a lot of time there. It's right in the middle of a bunch of other places that are named. And we know from the scriptures that Jesus regularly would go off to be alone with God. I picture him maybe going up on that same mountain or sitting in that cave or going swimming. or I, I don't know. But he spent time with his father often. But this particular day, this is right at the beginning of his ministry. And when it says his disciples, it literally means what disciples always means. It means followers. He hadn't even chosen the 12 yet. It means whoever was following him around at that point. At this point, there were probably thousands of people in the crowd that day. But here's how the story starts. Matthew 5, verses 1 to 2. And that's a misprint. It says 6, but it's 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be 
comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's a great series on Right Now Media right now called Your Kingdom Come by Jim Dalrymple. I hope I'm saying his name right. But he points out very accurately, if we would have written that today, if we would have made it up the way we tend to see it from American culture and too often from inside American churches, here's how we would have said it. Blessed are those who don't need other people. Blessed are those who are confident. Blessed are those who hunger for success and stay at it till they find it. Blessed are those who are comfortable. That sounds more like how we think about blessing today, doesn't it? But that's not how Jesus described it. Someone once asked C.S. Lewis what he thought about the Sermon on the Mount. Specifically, not what he thought about it, but they said, do do you like it? Are you fond of it? And his reply was, who can like being knocked flat on his face by a sledgehammer? I can hardly imagine a more deadly spiritual condition than that of a man who can read that passage with tranquil pleasure. Trust C.S. Lewis to always take it way deep even when it didn't need to be. But he's right. If we really get this, we've probably heard these words, snippets, maybe all at once. One time we had Billy Clark come out here and he's memorized the entire thing. And just the sermon that day was the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard this before. But I need you this morning. I beg you this morning. We've been praying about it this morning. Would you listen with fresh ears and fresh eyes? See what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you today. Because if we really get what Jesus is saying in this sermon, it literally just shakes up everything. And it shows us what happens next. In the chosen, Jesus says that it's, um, the introduction is kind of like a map to show where to find him. I, I see what they're saying with that. I think that there's a lot more to it than that, though. I think, if anything, when he says, blessed are the poor and blessed are these things, it's not so much that everybody who's poor has Jesus. I think what he's really saying is, if you really want to find Jesus, you're probably not going to find him by a bunch of rich, arrogant people. You're not going to find him among the people who are in power and are doing everything they can to hold on to that power. You're going to find him in situations where people know they need him and know they need each other, because that's where you find blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Got a glass of pure water right here. You're gonna have to trust me, it could be other things, I suppose. But it's water, and you can tell that it's pure. You can tell there's not a lot in there. The idea of purity means two core things, and they all matter here. I I think Jesus is talking about all of it at once. If something is pure, it is exactly what it says it is. If you have pure orange juice, it's pure orange juice, right? This is pure water. It's just water. There's nothing else in it. But that, that also means it's not got any contaminants in it. And I think a lot of times we only think about the part where we say, well, if we're pure, then we don't have any sin at all. But you know how you keep something pure? It's got to constantly be flushed out. The reason that you can drink out of springs is because they're constantly being refilled from a fresh source. You can't drink out of mud puddles because they're not. They probably started out pure water, but they're not now. The same thing with a lake. The water goes into a lake and then it kind of stays there for a while. It's fun to swim in it. You wouldn't want to drink it. It's not pure. Purity requires some help from somewhere else. And for us, our purity always is going to help require mostly help from Jesus Christ himself. But if we really look at his designs, what he's saying here, it also requires some help from each other. And I think this idea of purity flows through the rest of this. For example, the next thing he starts talking about is blessed are the peacemakers. Why are they so blessed? Well, because they're not worried about winning. They're not worried about getting an award for the best referee. They're not trying to be the hero. They just want there to be peace. They just want there to be wholeness again. They want the two groups that they're trying to help get along to actually get along again. And if that happens, they're happy. They're pure. 
Does that make sense? And there's so many of these other things that he talks about that it just makes sense. So we're supposed to be salt. We're supposed to be light. We're supposed to be showing the rest of the world what Jesus himself looks like. I like the idea of it being a map, but I'll tell you what I like even more. I think, it, if anything, the Sermon on the Mount is a portrait of Jesus himself. Jesus was poor in spirit. Jesus mourned. Go down that list, he was a peacemaker. And every other thing that he's asking us to do, he showed us exactly what that looks like. And ideally, hopefully, the, this becomes, as we follow him together, this becomes a portrait of us. Anybody who lives in the kingdom. Are we tracking so far? Read my emails? Checking my texts? Thank you. Do not think, Jesus said, that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This idea of the kingdom of heaven is, is again, it's this idea of what it looks like when we actually understand all this. It was foreshadowed in everything we've been looking at before. It started out in Eden. You had God and you had one man and one woman and a perfect creation. And they had that three system going on. They had everything right. It could have stayed that way, I guess, but it didn't. That's what we know for sure. Are you with me? Well, so God tried again. The first mountain we went to was Ararat. He showed us that we can start over. God gives us a chance to really start over. We looked at Sinai where God says, hey, you can actually really be transformed when you come into my presence and you choose to do the things I have for you and you join the team I have given you and you do the things that I'm asking you to do. And that we've learned in each one of these mountains that we can play our part well, we can find God's will and we can live it out. And whenever that is happening consistently, when the person who's clearly in charge it's Jesus. That's the kingdom of God. Is that heaven? Yes. Is that right here, right now? Yes. Does that make sense? Whenever we look like Jesus, whenever we're getting it right, whenever we're treating people the way Jesus says we should treat people in the Sermon on the Mount, that's the kingdom of heaven. Whenever we are made pure by Jesus himself and kept pure by following him together and holding each other accountable, staying in touch with him alone and in smaller groups and in big groups and continually getting the contaminants washed away, continually getting rid of the habits that hold us back even if they're not sinful, little by little becoming more and more until we just really, truly, all of us are just pure like Jesus. That is the kingdom of heaven. And that's what he's been talking about the whole time. I love to teach. I love to teach just about anything. One of my favorite things to teach is guitar. And when you teach somebody how to play the guitar, you usually start with some basics like how you hold the guitar. And then you talk about some other things. You usually start with a couple of chords. But pretty soon down the line, you start explaining why the chords work. Why is that a D chord? And why can you move that finger one space, that particular space, and suddenly it's a D minor, or it's a D seventh, or it's a D diminished, or whatever else? Why? How does that work? And once you start understanding how it works, and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And I love seeing those lights come on. Well, all through the Old Testament, God had been giving him, work with me here, guitar chords. He's been showing him, this is how you do this. This is how you play this song. This song is in this key and you use these chords. This is how it works. And then Jesus comes and he goes, let me explain how music actually works. Does that make sense? And that's what he's doing in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder but I tell you, if you have anger and you hold on to that anger, it's going to rip out your soul the same way as if you killed him. There's going to be different consequences, clearly. He's not saying that it's okay to murder anymore. He's not saying we should imprison people for being angry. We love to get it all complicated, don't we? But what, are you sure? Well, what is that? <laughs> Listen, what he's saying. 
Blessed means you're connected with God and with the people around you and you're living life as fully as you possibly could. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what Jesus came to make possible. If you're holding on to anger and unforgiveness to anyone, anywhere, all day long, every day, that stuff's not gonna happen for you. You are not living in the blessing. And you can say, hey, but I never killed anybody. Well, good for you. But Jesus says, you know what? The anger does the same thing. And then he goes on and he talks about adultery and lust. And he talks about, you've heard, how many have ever heard this before? But this is what he's saying. He's going, you know why? Let me show you why that's a D chord. Let me show you exactly how to make it into a D major seventh. Are you with me? He's showing us this is how it works. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That concept, that word, Greek word perfect is pretty deep actually. It, 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 can mean, it means a lot like, it's more like right than how we would think of perfect. We think of perfect as there's no mistakes or something like that. It's a lot like the concept of pure. We're never going to be perfect the way God is perfect. But he's saying be perfect as your father. Well, let me tell you how. God is who he is, and he really is that way. As we little by little become more like him, we actually have the hope through Jesus, through each other, through the things Jesus has taught us to do, we actually become purely the sons and daughters of God. That becomes who we are. That's not an identity we aspire to. That becomes our identity. And as we let Jesus himself wash away our sins, and as we let ourselves and the people around us and Jesus slowly get rid of all the fluff and all the contaminants, whether they're sin or not, until we're just doing what he called us to do, little by little, we become pure. That's what he's talking about, about being perfect as your father is perfect. He's not saying that we're going to be exactly like God and we've never had a sin in our lives. He's saying, you're actually going to become this other thing. That's what I was saying on Mount Sinai. That's what I was saying all along. This is how it works. But beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who's in heaven. See, show you my glass again. You're trusting me this is water. This could be a lot of other things. This could be white vinegar. This could be moonshine, <laughs> vodka. Uh, there's, this could be a whole lot of different things. Are you with me? Okay. It is water. It is water. People in the internet world, it's water. But you don't know that. You're trusting me in that. You have to have faith. <laughs> when you do good things, I don't know if it's for the right reasons. You know who does? You and God. Sometimes you can do everything that Jesus is telling you to do and still get it wrong because you're not pure. I don't know that. You look great to me. I think everything's going great. Look at you go. But God knows and you know. That's not a judgment. That's the warning straight from Jesus. You're the one who knows whether you're getting it right or not. So he continues. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Strange, strange old saying there, but you know what it means, I think. So... Do not let your right hand know, I'm sorry. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so your giving may be in secret and your father who sees what is in secret will reward you. And then he goes on, he talks about prayer in this same way. You should, 
Instead of praying on the street corner, blowing trumpets, hey, look, I'm praying, you should go alone and pray. And Jesus taught us several other places as well. We need to pray together. We intentionally come together to pray. In great big groups, all of us together in smaller groups, really focused on one thing. But, but it can't be about that. It's got to be actually connecting with your father. And if you look at that model prayer he gives in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, every element of that is about syncing it up with God's will. Far more than it's about trying to get God to do our will. Which leads to the other huge idea we see in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is obedient trust. Obedient trust. And here's what that means. That means having enough faith and enough courage that you're going to keep obeying Jesus in spite of your doubts and fears. It doesn't mean that you don't have doubts and fears. It means that you have enough faith to keep going anyway. If you are pure, even when you face persecution, even when you face hard times, even when the storms of life come, you're going to stay at it because that's really who you are now. That's really what you've built your whole life on now. So he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It kind of works like ripples in a pool. Does anybody like to do that just for fun? Just drop a rock in the water. I love that. My boys and I used to do that when they were little. And just, I never told them it should be fun, but the first rock... Let me get some more rocks. It's just fun. It's cool. If you haven't done it in a while, I recommend it. The older you are, the better. Get out there. Be a kid again. That was, that's not biblical. That's just me. But I believe it. But when you drop a rock in a pool and the, the ripples go out, I think it's a lot like that. Jesus wants us to, the stuff we do in private the stuff we do that only he knows about, the stuff we do that we just don't care if anybody else finds out about or not, those things are like the rock going in the pool. But that stuff, whatever we do when we're all alone, that's what shapes who we really are more than anything. And then that goes out. That's gonna shape the kind of people we partner with, the people that we spent make our closest circle, the people that we are in a small group or a Sunday school group or a Bible study with, the people that we call at 2 a.m., those people, that's, and that relationship is gonna shape the bigger relationships we have all around us. Is, is this making sense? It's, it goes out that way. That inside needs to be pure, and then the next part needs to be pure, and they're gonna help you keep pure, and then the outside helps all of those little groups stay pure, It's this constant, like, ongoing thing. Now it gets really crazy. Now Jesus starts meddling. Now we start getting a sledgehammer to the face, as C.S. Lewis would say. Because he says, okay, so if you trust me that much and you're going to make your treasures are in heaven, not on earth, don't be anxious about your life anymore. Oh, really? Really? Not at all. I'm not supposed to worry at all. I'm not supposed to be afraid at all. See, see, I think that even those of us who really trust God and really believe in God, and we really believe he has the best for us and his will is best, whether we like it or not, we really believe that. But at the same time, we worry that what if his best for us isn't what I would really like? What if... His blessings are what I really need, but it's not the blessings I would have picked out. It doesn't feel like a blessing. It doesn't look like a blessing. Maybe it's, I'm okay with it, but the people around me who their faith is struggling, what if it doesn't look like a blessing to them and so they don't believe? Come on, God, show off for them. Do the thing for them. Am I the only person here? Rich Mullins has a song called Hard. It's hard to be like Jesus. It's a wonderful song. In the middle, he says, Well, his eye is on the sparrow and the lilies of the field I've heard, and he will watch over you and he will watch over me so we can dress like flowers and eat like birds. 
And honestly, sometimes that's what it feels like because we're going, really? That's, that's what you're going to do at this moment. But Jesus says, no, that's, that's how much you got to trust me. And then he just keeps digging. He says, okay, and you also can't judge other people. He's not talking about judging what's right or wrong. He gets to call what's right or wrong. And we get to learn that. And little by little by little by little, we start to see things from his perspective. That's a different thing. Saying what's a sin and what's not, that's not our call. But when we say, you did that sin, therefore you can't be part of me. He's like, no, 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 no. Because I could do the same thing and I will do the same thing to you because of your sin, if that's how you treat everybody else. I need you to be pure. And I need you to trust me on this. I need you to know that in that prayer I just taught you five minutes ago, in the middle of this sermon, I said, if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. I need you to trust me on this, and you need to forgive others. Don't condemn others. Don't go judging other people. I'm going to use the same measure on you that you use on other people. Anybody feeling like a sledgehammer's been hitting you in the face for a little bit? It, it hurts, but it's real. And this is what Jesus is telling us. And then he says, keep on asking. Most translations just say ask or seek or knock. But the original Greek there, it's, it's a continual action. It's something you do and you keep doing. And not in an annoying way, like, you know, like asking. You know how like kids go, mom, 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 mom. It's not like that. It's kids come back to, and ask their mom for stuff because they know their mom's going to give them those stuff, right? And sometimes they go to their dad because they know their dad's going to give them other stuff, right? Kids are smart. And they know grandma's going to give them something else. You, you know what I'm saying? Kids know what they're up to. But it's like, seriously, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, when you're that kind of person, that's when you're going to actually get the answers and the, the stuff that you need. This had to have been just an amazing moment of clarity and also confusion. And also it had to have been very disturbing. There's no way that the people who walked away from the actual first Sermon on the Mount just said, well, that was fun. There's no way they walked away and said, wow, that was profound. That was, that was good. I like that. What's for dinner? There's no way. Because it was too life-rattling. It was too like, wow. It was everything they'd heard up to that point. All of the rhythms suddenly start. They still didn't totally get it, but they're like, oh, that's how music works. Still can't play guitar, but wow. I think I, think, I, think I understand why I want to now. I think I need that guy to teach me how to play guitar. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's a metaphor. I'm just making sure. So then here comes several other things I know you've heard. If anybody knows anything a lot about, at all about the Sermon on the Mount, they know the golden rule in the middle of it. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And actually, a lot of people thought that went up. Buddha says very similar things. That's, that's in a lot of different things. But Jesus makes it very clear in this last part of his sermon that all religions are not the same. First big sermon out there, he throws it all out on the table and he says, listen, there's a very narrow gate. And if you don't enter through that gate, you don't get to God. And he repeats that over and over throughout the other gospels, throughout the other stories, throughout his other messages and stories. But he makes it very, very clear here. And he says that all, uh, all of the prophets, all the people who supposedly or genuinely speak for God, you're going to know whether they're real or not by their fruit. What happens? What happens in their life? What happens around them? What kind of results happen? he says, not even everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not even the people who, not all the people who claim to follow me even are actually following me. Again, this could be just about anything. Not even all of them are really for real. You're going to have to pay attention. And so you know, you know how you're going to know? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. 
How many have ever heard that story? Would you sing the song with me? I, I know most of you at least know it. If you don't, don't feel bad because junior church isn't in the Bible. It's okay if you missed that part of your life. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The rain came tumbling down. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. You know the rest. It's sad. We're not going to read that part. <laughs> but this is the thing. What Jesus is calling us into today, what he's always going to call into is the same thing he started with in his ministry. The same thing he started out in this moment of clarity up on a mountain right at the beginning of his earthly ministry. He's saying the same thing. Only you and God know for sure whether you're right or not. Who, who ended up being the people that killed Jesus? You remember? Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders that legalistically were perfect. They looked great. But I'm telling you, it was white vinegar or something. <laughs> Jesus says, listen, I need you to be pure. I need you to actually get this right. Your righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees and Sadducees. You've got to make sure that things are right between you and God and with you and other people. You've got to get this right. And I can help with that, says Jesus. And he also talks about very clearly that this is a process that continues. As pure as this water is, what's going to happen if I just set it here for a week? It's not pure anymore. After another week or another week, you don't even want to be in the same room. It's got to constantly be in fleshed out by fresh water, which is why we do all the stuff that we do with other people, which is why we do what we do alone with God, which is why we give in private and in public when needed because people need help. And we, we do it when we pray together and we pray alone and all those things. We do those things because we're constantly being remade in the image of God together. We're constantly going through the motions, not in the sense that we're pretending, we're actually doing what Jesus does. It's like he's, you know, like when they have those dances and there's like one person out in the front and they're doing all this and then everybody else is doing the same thing behind them. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, okay, so here's Jesus out in the front and we're doing our best behind. But after a while, we learn the dance. I can't dance, so that's a really bad example. <laughs> but you get it, right? So we're doing these things because that's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus looks like. And when we start to do those things and go those places and love those people and do those things and sync up daily with God, and with each other, we actually become pure. And how do we start doing that? By obedient trust. By having enough faith that no matter how much you still are afraid, how much you don't understand, how much you're, you're struggling, whatever the storms are in your life right now, and Jesus very clearly said they would come, we make sure that we have built our life on the foundation that he gave us himself. We build our lives on the person and on the teachings of Jesus himself. And if that's true for you today, you can just stand in a second and just rejoice and do that. If there's even the slightest little shift that needs to happen, the slightest little things that need to purify you this morning, I don't know that, but you do and Jesus does. And I'm going to ask you to do that. And if it's a big deal, I invite you to make it public. If you just need prayer, you can go to the back or come to the front. But I'm asking you, brothers and sisters, this morning, let the blood of Jesus flow this morning. Let the pure water of life, Jesus himself, flow this morning. I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying that you guys look dirty and whatever else. I'm saying... We all need fleshed out by the pure water of Jesus every single day. Whatever that means to you today, would you have enough faith to name that thing? Would you have enough faith to claim that thing and say, I I'm going to give this to God today?